on Sunday, right? Many of you are regular customers, so you've been here many times, and you know that the point of Science Sundays is to directly bring uh, the fruits of scientific research to you, the public, and they give you a chance to interact with the practitioners of that science. Today is a special day because we're partnering with, uh, actually, a few announcements, I forgot to say. So if you're not already on the Science Sundays email list, I encourage you to get on that list. You'll get an email about once a month. This is the last Science Sundays talk of this semester. We'll, we will resume in the fall. And if you want to find the, the way to get on the email list, just Google Ohio State Science Sundays. And that will also give you access to the videos of the last several years' worth of talks. And uh, also, probably in the next few weeks, we'll be sending around a survey asking people basically, you know, what's going well, what could be going better, and what are some topics you'd be interested in seeing in the future. Okay, so today, um, after the lecture, the, the reception will be, I confirmed it this time for sure, in the uh, traditions room upstairs. And you'll have a chance to, um, if you didn't already, have a chance to buy one of Dr. Strathdee's books right out front. There'll be a little 15-minute gap here where we're selling the books. And then if you bring it upstairs, you'll have a chance to get it signed. Okay, so anyway, today's lecture is a special one, not just because of the very distinguished speaker, but because we're collaborating with the Department of Molecular Genetics. We're collaborating in particular with Dr. Sa Dr. Sarah Ball, who is a, an assistant professor of teaching, uh, assistant teaching professor in, in, in there. And she runs the CFAGES program, which is, gives a chance for undergrads to not only learn material in the classroom, but to develop some research skills. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Ball to introduce the speaker. All right, good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Stephanie Strathdee. Dr. Strathdee is an infectious disease epidemiologist who is Associate Dean of Global Health Sciences and Harold Simon Distinguished Professor of Medicine at UC San Diego, where she now co-directs the Center for Innovative Phage Applications and Therapeutics, otherwise known as IPATH. In 2016, Strathdee and colleagues were credited with saving her husband's life from a deadly superbug infection using bacteriophages. Strathdee and her husband co-authored their memoir called The Perfect Predator, A Scientist's Race to Save Her Husband from a Deadly Superbug, which is what we were able to purchase out front. For her efforts to revitalize phage therapy in the West, she was named one of Time Magazine's most influential people in healthcare in 2018. I've been working with students since 2011 to isolate bacteriophages as part of HHMI's C-phages lab. So early last year, when Dr. Strathdee reached out to me about possibly collaborating, I was already aware of the amazing work that she was doing. Uh, now, with funding from the Herbert W. Hoover Foundation, uh, students this year have been isolating bacteriophages to send to IPATH's ladder, li library uh, to potentially treat patients battling superbug infections in the future. Um, so it's some really exciting work and collaboration that's going on. So please join me in welcoming our uh, speaker today, Dr. Strathdee, as she discusses the history of phage therapy and the exciting advances in the field. you can hear me. All right. right. Um, so it's, it's a real pleasure to be here today. It's uh, quite a crowd. Um, it's a little cold here. Um, it's very spoiled in uh, San Diego. Um, and this is uh, a little bit of an unusual presentation. If I could ask um, the folks to put my slides on, that would be great. Okay, so just I'll fill up the time a little bit. So I am an infectious disease epidemiologist, so I knew a little bit about the viruses that we used to um, cure my husband from his superbug infection, but I'm not an MD and I'm not a virologist. I thought that viruses were the bad guy, right? Um, you know, I'm an AIDS researcher. Um, I know a lot about HIV, Ebola, all those nasty viruses. I didn't ever realize that viruses could be used as medicine, and so that's why the title of this talk is called The Enemy of My Enemy is My Friend. Um, so this story is actually um, eight years old now. It was um, in 2015 when my husband and I were on vacation in Egypt when this um, problem started. Um, we 
we like to travel, um, go to conferences, and we'll add a few couple of personal days, and my husband really wanted to see the Valley of the Kings. And so we booked this trip to Egypt, and um, right before we went, um, there was a terrorist attack at Sharm El Sheikh. And, oh, here we go. Good. So I'll just keep going. <laughs> um, so, um, so here we are on, vac on vacation in Egypt. Um, there had been a terrorist attack in Sharm El Sheikh. Everybody canceled on this tour except us. My husband said it's the perfect time to go. There won't be any crowds. And I was really nervous about this, but he was insistent. I actually penned out an addendum to our will. I uh, left it at home where my parents were um, house sitting and looking after my worm composter and our three cats. And, um, and my mom said, are you, like, are you sure that you want to do this? And Tom says, yes, we're absolutely going. And so we were on one of those um, boats like that was going up and down the Nile. And we were literally the only two people on the boat. <laughs> you know, I even did one of those things um, in the Titanic where you get in the front of the boat and go, oh. <laughs> I probably shouldn't have done that. Maybe that was a bad omen. OK, so it looks like I have to enter my password. And hopefully, we'll be on our way. All right, hopefully, I'll be up in a minute. Um, so that's, that's really where our story began, was in this um, you know, Egyptian um, on this boat. And then you know, we had this wonderful meal on top of the cruise ship the night before we were supposed to see the Valley of the Kings. And um, my husband was a six foot five, 300 pounds. He ate a lot more than me. And it was this seafood meal. And you know, he, he got violently ill afterwards. And I just assumed he got food poisoning. And, um, and I was really annoyed with him because he was keeping me up all night, you know, running back and forth to the bathroom. I was not the sympathetic wife that everybody thinks that I am now. Um, and so, but the next day, he, he couldn't keep anything down. Um, and I started to get concerned. And so um, I, I called a colleague of ours back home. And um, he was the head of infectious diseases at the University of California, San Diego. And, um, you know, it's nice to have friends in high places. And he said, yeah, it does sound like, you know, Tom really needs to get to the local hospital. Um, and um, hopefully, you know, um, you know, it's just something minor, but it could be more than food poisoning. It could be a twisted bowel or something like that. So definitely get him to the, the local hospital. So I called a doctor to the ship, and the doctor said, Wow, um, you know, I, I'm sure it's probably just food poisoning. Gave him intravenous antibiotics and some fluids and said he'll be fine in a couple hours. He'll be up for dinner. <laughs> well, he was not up for dinner. And by this point, he started to complain even more. And um, he had um, stranger symptoms. Up until this point, I literally was calculating incubation periods for different pathogens that you could acquire from food, because I was just assuming that that's what it was. And when he started complaining of back pain, I thought, you know what, like I'm not a doctor, but it doesn't take a brain surgeon to realize that, you know, back pain is not a symptom associated with food poisoning. And so, um, you know, I called um, our, my colleague back, um, Dr. Chip Schooley, the head of infectious diseases, and he said, no, he really does need to get to a hospital now. So I called the doctor back to the ship because there was no 911 or anything. Um, and so it took a half an hour um, to kind of get this organized. An ambulance had to come. Six men had to take him on a gurney from the top level of, of the ship down. And then they had kind of daisy chained all of these boats beside one another. So that we had to go through three different boats just to get to shore, up these you know, really old, ancient steps um, to get him into the ambulance. And boy, I tell you, um, I was starting to get scared. Um, we got him to the clinic, because there was no hospital in Luxor where we were based. And um, there, they woke up several uh, physicians who uh, helped diagnose him with um, pancreatitis. Okay. All right. Okay, I can skip to the slides now. But I have to tell you a couple of disclosures. So I'm an advisor unpaid to a phage company. All patient photos are shown with permission today. And um, I always do a land attribution because um, we live on lands that belong to other people. So I, I live on Kumiye unceded land.
So um, here's the pictures from Egypt that I was telling you about where we were hamming it up, having a great old time. And there's where you can see the Tom, yeah, he's like overweight, but there he is crawling like backwards into the Red Pyramid, you know, 300 feet down on Thanksgiving Day of 2015. So he wasn't like ill or anything, at least not from the outside. Um, but three days later, this is after we got him to the clinic. And um, luckily, they did have a CT clinic um, in Luxor, so they wheeled him into this um, you know, CT machine. You can see he's in terrible pain. And whatever they saw on that image, um, they didn't like the looks of. And so the doctors helped us um, get him organized for medevac, so air ambulance. Um, and that's the first lesson here, is that when you're traveling to a lower middle income country, it's a really good idea to not just have regular travel insurance, but to have the kind that allows you to be air ambulanced out. It doesn't necessarily come with your standard um, travel insurance. And so seven ambulances and um, two Lear jets to take uh, Tom home. Um, and that cost me 37 bucks, so that was a pretty good deal. <laughs> but I can laugh about it now, but at the time it was absolutely harrowing. So he was too sick to get him home right off the bat. Um, so he was um, air ambulance to Frankfurt, Germany, where you can see the right hand side of this slide. We're in full PPE now. And now everybody knows what PPE is um, due to COVID, but this was before the COVID pandemic and I wasn't accustomed to wearing a gown and gloves and a mask and booties just to go in to see my husband. But they said, look, he's coming from Egypt. We don't know what's going on. This is a precaution. So I thought it was a precaution to prevent him from getting things from other people. <laughs> it turns out it was the other way around because um, they did an endoscopy where they you know, put a tube down to, uh, to explore to see what's going on. And they realized that what had caused this pancreatitis, um, which is an inflammation of the pancreas, was that a gallstone had stuck in his bile duct and caused an abscess to form that was the size of a small football. And so he'd been walking around with this abscess um, without even knowing it. And unfortunately, somewhere along the line in Egypt, um, he acquired um, a bacterial infection. And not just um, any uh, bacterial infection, but one that has got this um, terrible nickname called Arachobacter, because so many bacteria come back from the Middle East with this bug. And um, it's called Acinetobacter bomaniae, for those of you who are into the microbiology. Um, and when um, this culture came back a couple days later, the doctors were even more alarmed, because this organism is kind of acquired superpowers. It's really good at stealing antimicrobial resistance genes from other bacteria and from the environment. And it was later sequenced, so we know it was an Egyptian strain, um, and we don't know where he acquired it, um, but somewhere there. And um, this um, organism has, has shut down um, hospital clinics um, uh, around the world because it's, let, it's caused a different outbreak. So they were really um, worried, and they kept us in isolation within the ICU. Now, um, this organism is one of 12 um, that are what I call the dirty dozen. The World Health Organization has made a list of the most serious bacterial <laughs> pathogens to human health. Tuberculosis really is the worst one, kills almost 2 million people per year. But apart from that, Acinetobacter bomaniae is at the top of the list. Now, when the German doctor said in this accent that I couldn't really understand at first what this was, and then he wrote it down for me, I was Oh my goodness, this is an organism that I used to plate on my Petri dishes when I was in the um, you know, microbiology class back in the 1980s at the University of Toronto where I studied. And it was considered to be a really wimpy organism back then. Uh, all we needed was a lab coat and gloves to handle it. But over the last 30 years or so, it's acquired these superpowers, as I mentioned. So it can stick to hospital linens. It can even stick to body lice. And um, as I mentioned, it's been implicated with a lot of um, deaths of troops that have come back from the Middle East with shrapnel um, inf associated infections. And so they survived their bomb blast, but they died of, of this Arachobacter. Now, um, nobody knew right off the bat how um, you know, resistant this organism was to antibiotics because that's not a standard test that a lot of clinics or hospitals do. So they had to outsource this, um, and a couple of days later they came back with what they call an antibiogram 
which is essentially an antibiotic susceptibility profile. Now, this is in German, because we were in Germany, but you don't need to understand German to know that this is really bad news, because in this chart are different antibiotics, and the R beside them means resistant. So it was already resistant to 15 different antibiotics right off the top, and only partially susceptible to three. And uh, that's what I call the gorillacillins, which are um, antibiotics that have to be infused into the patient. And they're very toxic, um, really hard on the kidneys, for example. So they put them on a cocktail of those antibiotics, and um, that's when I started to get worried. Uh, up until this point, I thought that, you know, something that you catch on vacation, modern medicine can handle it, right? Well, this um, situation made me realize that my husband was an, you know, a poster child for this post-antibiotic era that we are entering. Um, the CDC in the U.S. and the World Health Organization and the United Nations have all been telling us that we're running out of antibiotics. That's because we've been overusing and misusing them um, in agriculture and aquaculture. Um, and, um, and so these different antibiotics are now um, you know, not effective anymore because bacteria have generated resistance against them. So just a couple of statistics for you. Um, in the year before COVID, the first global estimates of the number of people dying from antimicrobial resistance, or AMR, were published in one of the top medical journals, The Lancet. And so, um, you know, like 5 million people are dying per year globally um, with superbug infections, and it's directly accounting for 1.2 million deaths, and that's worsened under COVID. So it's estimated that by 2050, one person every three seconds, or 10 million people per year, are going to be dying from superbug infections. And, um, you know, this is something that, you know, had really crept up on me. I, I didn't realize how bad the superbug uh, problem was. Now, uh, I mentioned that it's our overuse and misuse of antibiotics that has gotten us into this mess, but the majority of antibiotics in the US and, and in many countries are actually used in agriculture and in livestock. Uh, so for example, to make animals grow fatter faster. It was discovered um, many decades ago that you could use antibiotics in a healthy animal and it would make them grow fatter faster. So they're being used off label as growth promoters. And even in countries where there's a ban on doing that, there are loopholes to get around it. And there is an agribusiness lobby that is in ensuring that, that you know, this is still happening. So for example, millions of pounds of streptomycin, a medically important antibiotic, are being sprayed on citrus trees around the US. And even though that's been shown not to work, so, um, so this is a big problem, and it's one that we have unwittingly, um, you know, contributed to. Now, um, Tom's bacteria that had acquired resistance, um, when it was sequenced, it was found to have a gene called the MCR1 gene. And this is a gene that was discovered and reported on in November 2015, the very month that he fell ill. And when this paper was published in The Lancet, um, the doctors who treat um, people with superbug infections, infectious disease physicians, they were really worried because they said, this is our last resort antibiotic called colistin, and this MCR1 gene confers resistance to colistin. So if we don't even have colistin left, we're really in, in trouble. Now this um, paper was published in China where um, colistin was still being fed to pigs, to, to, again, because it, it makes them grow fatter faster. And um, luckily, um, this kind of um, attention put pressure on China to stop using colistin in pigs, um, but they still ship it to other countries like Bangladesh and Nigeria and Pakistan where it's being used there. So uh, not surprisingly, um, you know, there's a big problem with antimicrobial resistance in those countries. But this is a global problem because it isn't just like you have, you know, a, a gene that is discovered in China or Nigeria or Mexico or wherever. Um, because of globalization, these um, genes travel in bacteria, on people, on planes, everywhere. So for example, that MCR1 gene was discovered in wastewater in LA County last year. Um, so it's here, it's now, and certainly it was in Tom. So 
Um, the doctors in Germany stabilized him and they got him back to San Diego right before Christmas of 2015. So he'd now been in the hospital a couple of weeks. Um, and they repeated that antibiogram to, to see, you know, how he was doing. And unfortunately, those last three antibiotics that the bug was partially sensitive to, mm -mm, it was now fully resistant. So they call that pan resistance. That means there's no antibiotics left that will treat it. And that's when we started to get really worried because up until this point, we thought, well, maybe we can operate and somebody can take that abscess out of his abdomen. But they said, we can't operate on somebody who has a pan-resistant infection in their body because if that organism gets into the bloodstream, they're gonna undergo septic shock. There's nothing to cover it and they'll, he'll die. So um, what they did instead was poke holes in his abdomen and try to siphon off this infected fluid with, through drains. And these drains kept getting clogged because you know there's a lot of bacterial debris and tissue. And so they kept having to add more and more drains. So over the next couple of months, there were five drains and a feeding tube because he couldn't eat. They had to put him on a ventilator. So in this picture, you can see that he's on a trach vent and that meant that his lungs are failing. He was now on three different medications to keep his heart pumping called pressors. So he was in heart failure and his kidneys were hanging on by a thread. So my doctor's friends who were, you know, were at the university hospital where, um, you know, I'm, I'm working and they said, you know, he isn't going to make it. Um, we don't think, um, do you want to start kidney dialysis when the day comes that his kidneys fail? So I really knew that they were asking me, do you want to pull the plug? And um, it was a terrifying moment, and I um, decided to ask Tom what he would want to do. You know, like many couples, you have you know your will, you have your advanced directives. We talked all about that. He had always said to me, and we had it written down, that if I'm brain dead, uh, pull the plug. But this was a situation where his brain was alive, but his body was dying, and I didn't know what he wanted me to do. So I didn't know if he could hear me the day that we took this photo. He was in a coma and um, I asked him, I said, honey, you know, I want to grow old with you. Um, I really want you to live. Um, if you're too tired and you want to give up, I'll understand. So, but if you want to live, please squeeze my hand and I will leave no stone unturned. And I was terrified um, and I waited in about a minute and he squeezed my hand really hard and I thought, oh, great. And then I realized, oh shit, like, <laughs> what am I going to do now? It's not like I have some secret weapon. I'm not a medical doctor, but um, I did go home and I hit the internet. Um, I am a scientist. I've been well-trained and I know how to do a literature search. So something that's better than Google Scholar is called PubMed. Um, the National Library of Medicine makes this search engine available, P-U-B-M-E-D. It's a real um, great resource. Anybody can put keywords of any kind. Um, into the search engine and up will pop, um, you know, medical research like this paper. Um, when I put the words of, of his superbug infection, alternative treatments, up pop this paper, emerging therapies for multi-drug resistant acinetobacter pulmonii. And buried in it was something called phage therapy. And that was when a little bell went off in my head because I remembered from my 1986 course in virology that Phage is short for bacteriophage, and that these are viruses that have naturally evolved to attack bacteria. In fact, they have been discovered over 100 years ago. Um, in uh, 1917, a guy by the name of Félix de Harel, um, a French-Canadian self-taught microbiologist, um, deduced when he was involved in an outbreak um, uh, in Paris, children were dying of dysentery, and some of the children um, lived. And so he took their poop and he um, filtered it and put it through a Pasteur filter, which kind of looks like um, a porcelain funnel. And um, it filters out bacteria. And so um, the filtrate, he um, used that and, and added a, it to a suspension with the bacteria in it that was causing the problem. I think it was Shigella. And he incubated that for 24 hours and he came back and that um, fluid which had been turbid with all of the bacteria that were swimming around in there, um, a fluid you know, was clear. There was no bacteria left. So he, he said, well, it w if I filtered it through a Pasteur filter, whatever this is, must be smaller than a bacteria. 
And if it's been gobbling up these bacteria, then it must be a parasite of bacteria. So ergo, it must be a virus. So he and his wife cooked up the name bacteriophage, derived from the word phagein, um, which means to devour in Greek. And so um, he believes that you know he's got this, this potential treatment for bacterial infections. Well, the, the trouble was at the time, um, nobody knew if this was true or not because this was all you know deduced in Felix's head. Only the light microscope existed. And there was a lot of people who thought that what this was, was an enzyme. And so there was even a lawsuit between Felix and some Nobel laureates who he ticked off because, you know, he's a guy who never even went to college. And what did he know? You know, so there was, um, it was, it was quite entertaining reading about it. Um, but at the time I was just devouring this, trying to find out what this was and, and how evolved um, the understanding was. Felix um, actually became uh, famous in the 1920s and 30s. Um, he was the inspiration for the book Aerosmith that won the Pulitzer Prize. He used these um, bacteriophage preparations, whatever they were, to treat bacterial infections um, in children, the same children that were involved in that outbreak, um, after he experimented on himself and his family and um, lab co-workers, um, he got permission from the hospital and the parents of these children to, to try this suspension on them and, and it cured them. So, um, so you know, he, he really, it was, it, it, phage therapy was in its heyday in the, in the 1930s. Um, and the first phage therapy program to ever start in the world was established in what is now Tbilisi, Georgia. It's um, now called the Ilyava Center after Georgi Ilyava, who's the young man who's pictured on the right along with a much older Felix de Harel. So Felix helped Georgi um, set up this program and it even had Stalin's blessing. Um, and of course, that was not a good thing, um, according to the West, because this is leading up now to World War II. So phage therapy got this reputation of being Soviet science, Soviet medicine, and um, the West wanted nothing to do with it. So um, when penicillin was um, ushered into um, the, the battlefield in 1942, um, it was discovered in 1928, but it took all this time to kind of develop the manufacturing processes to get it ready. And of course, it was this is how Big Pharma was really born with penicillin. Um, so the West embraced penicillin, forgot all about phage therapy, and phage therapy continued to be used and in um, Russia and um, the former Soviet Union now, and in parts of um, um, Eastern Europe, like Poland, where um, there's been phage therapy going on for decades decades where it's considered to be standard of care, but here it's considered to be experimental treatment. And there was, was absolutely no experience in the U.S. with phage therapy. So uh, before I tell you exactly how we went about trying to get this for Tom, I'll show you that this is a, um, a modern day uh, scanning electron micrograph. The, uh, my electron microscope was developed by the Germans in the early 1940s and one of the first things that was ever visualized on them were bacteriophage. So um, this is a bacterium stained in orange. Um, this magnification is 100,000 times and attaching to that bacterium are these phages. They look like alien spiders, don't they? But we now know that they come in all shapes and sizes. So I've put a couple of different um, images on the bottom of this slide. And essentially what viruses do, they attach to a, um, their host. In this case, it's a bacterial cell host. Um, and they attach um, to a receptor. So if that receptor isn't there on that bacterial cell wall, they don't attach. Um, and um, if that receptor is there, they drill into the bacterial cell, inject their genetic material, which is usually DNA, and that DNA takes over that bacterial cell and turns it into a phage manufacturing plant. So essentially this bacterium is not making um, any bacteria anymore, it's only making phage. And um, if it's the phage rage uh, lifestyle of, of the bacteriophage, uh, all these baby phages are assembled inside the bacterium and when given the kill signal, 
they burst out in what is called lysis and they kill that bacterial cell and all these baby phages go on to attack other bacteria but they only again attack the bacterium that has their receptor so that's the beauty of phage because they will only attack the bad bacterium and and they will leave the other friendly bacterium alone in the microbiome now compare that to antibiotics if you have a broad spectrum antibiotic like penicillin and many others they're killing all the friendly bacteria in the microbiome or a lot of them anyway and we know know that that's not a good thing uh, because there are friendly bacteria in our microbiome but it turns out it's actually the phage that are keeping those bacterial numbers in check they're the ones that are keeping the, the bacterial numbers in the ocean in check it's just that we haven't really known that they were there or how to study them so my crash course on phage therapy kept me up till all hours of the night and I thought, well, we should be able to use phage to cure Tom. Um, I wonder how we're going to do that. Well, um, I asked um, my colleague, Chip Schooley, the same one who I dialed from um, Egypt, and he was involved in Tom's care from the outset. And he said, wow, what an interesting and intriguing idea, phage therapy. We all learned about that in medical school, but it's probably ahead of its time. Well, it turns out it was 100 years behind its time. Um, but he said, you know, like we're a teaching hospital, we're a cutting edge place. And obviously Tom is gonna die unless something like drastic happens. So if you can find phages that are a match for his bacterial isolate, I'll call the FDA and see if I can get permission to give it to him on a compassionate basis. So that's when I got you know, scared even more because I realized you know, through my reading that there's an estimated 10 million trillion trillion phages on the planet. That's 10 to the power of 31. And in the book, the copy editor said, are you sure you meant to have trillion trillion like twice? And I said, yes, yes, it's like 10 to the power of 31. So there's like, you know, like a trillion phages in a drop of, of water, for example. So how are you going to find the perfect predator to kill the bacteria that you want to kill? Well, you go to people who are phage hunters. So um, the phage hunt began. I went back to the internet. I knew nobody doing this. This was not my field, right? So I, I had to do research to find um, phage researchers who um, were willing to help me. And um, the first person who got back to me who said that he would help was Dr. Ryland Young from Texas A&M University. And he said, you know, your story really struck a chord. I'm the same age as your husband. I'm close to retirement. And I've wanted to see if phage could come back to the West, you know, um, and because right now he says a lot of us are just working on the fringes and we're not really respected and phage could really, you know, help with the superbug crisis. And maybe you're somebody who could cut through the red tape to make this happen. So he said that he would turn his lab into a command center. And on the right hand side are the folks that put their lives on hold. Um, the woman in the necklace is uh, Dr. Adriana Carolina Hernandez. She was a PhD student at the time. I learned later um, after the book was published that she slept in the laboratory for a couple weeks. She was hunting for phage and she found four that were a match. And she named the, two of the new ones, Mago and Maestro, uh, Magic and, and, and Maestro. Um, and so, um, but where did she find them? Well, she found them in some of the craziest places because wherever you find a lot of bacteria, you find the perfect predator that will kill them. So literally, they sourced phage from sewage, from barnyard waste, from, um, and it was just crazy to think that, you know, you can go to the, some of the gnarliest places and turn it into medicine. Um, so um, one of the other things that happened is they reached out to a fellow across the pond, Dr. Jean-Paul Pirnay, who headed up a program um, at the Royal Astrid Military Hospital in Belgium. And he said, you know, I realize you're looking for phages from environmental sources, but we have some phage that I could ship to you in a diplomatic pouch. And so, you know, this is a guy who's a total stranger was going to go to at the ends of the earth to make this happen. Well, it turns out those phages were not a match for Tom, but just the fact that he offered to do this was the impetus for how the U.S. Navy got involved in Tom's case. <laughs> and so what happened is Dr. Schooley, after he learned that Texas A&M found some phages that were a match, he called the FDA and he, and he planned on explaining to them all what phage was and why this was the only uh, thing that would possibly work. And they knew all about phage therapy. 
Um, the doctor there, Dr. Cara Fiore, said, you know, we literally have been waiting for a case like this. A patient who's dying with no antibiotic options left, a family who's willing to, you know, try something really outside of the box, a university and, and hospital and doctor that are willing to kind of, you know, take the risk and cut through the red tape to make this happen. And boy, did we ever get our wish with this Tom Patterson guy. So, um, so they were on board. Um, and then she said, well, you know, um, Stephanie in her search might have overlooked a couple of people and, and, you know, Chip's going, I think she did a pretty thorough search. And she says, well, I don't think she'd know that the army and the Navy have been involved in sourcing phage. Um, so that's how um, Lieutenant Commander Theron Hamilton, who's a dead ringer for Tom Cruise, got involved. Uh, so he headed up the U.S. Navy Biologic Defense and Research Directorate program in Frederick, Maryland. Um, and now why do they have phages? Well, um, they've been sourcing phages from the bilges of ships, and they thought that maybe they could be used to treat troops that were coming back with infections um, and to also be ready if there was ever a bioterrorist attack. Um, and um, I learned, although I wasn't supposed to find this out, um, after the book was published, um, I was told that um, the way that the Navy's phage program started was that this was the team that identified anthrax on the contaminated letters that were sent by a domestic terrorist. Um, you might remember in around 2001, there were some letters that were sent to congressmen and some um, famous people, um, and they had anthrax spores on them. Well, it was the phage from this program that was used to identify those spores on that letter. So, because anthrax is a bioterrorist or uh, bioterrorism organism. So, um, uh, Lieutenant Commander Theron Hamilton, when he was asked by Chip to um, get involved in Tom's case, he said, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this, um, but better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Um, send me his isolate. I'll see if any of our phages are a match, and I'll get my colleague, Dr. Biswajit Biswas, who's affectionately known as the phage whisperer, I kid you not, <laughs> to look to see if any of the Navy phages were a match, and four of them were. So um, how did they do this? Well, here's a, you know essentially what's called the plaque assay. And this is an old-fashioned version of it, but just to get the point across. So this is a, a flask of sewage. This is a Petri dish that's streaked with Acinetobacter baumannii. So every one of those globs is, is a bacterial colony. And if you want to see if you have um, you know, a, a sample of, of, of sewage or whatever you, whatever you got the, the, the um, water for, from, you can put it on the dish and, and incubate it for 24 to 48 hours. And if it comes back looking like Swiss cheese, even though you don't have to put this under a microscope, you can see that the bacterial colonies have been kind of gobbled up. Um, and I use that loosely, but they are, are gone because the phage de devoured them. So you know you have a phage match. You get excited. You can pluck that out with a pipette and put it in more bacterial suspension to grow that phage up in sufficient quantities to use it to treat somebody. So that's what gets done in phage therapy, only often you don't have a big Petri dish, you have lots of little micro wells. Um, and um, so now we had you know, the potential for two different phage preparations to be used to treat Tom. But there was a real problem because nobody had any experience doing this in the US. So Dr. Schooley, who's pictured in the middle, um, really had to do a lot of homework behind the scenes. And he contacted Dr. Maya Mirabishvili, who um, was trained at the Iliava Center in Georgia and now works um, in Belgium. And she said, we don't treat people um, intravenously because we don't have a way of purifying the phage to know, um, you know if it's safe or not. Um, but she advised on um, how to treat um, through the catheters in his abdomen. And he also reached out to a fellow named Dr. Carl Merrill, who headed up a phage therapy program, um, actually a basic science phage program, um, at the uh, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And uh, Dr. Tony Fauci, who you all know from COVID days, shut down this lab because he said it's not going to cure AIDS, it's not really doing anything. And so Dr. Merrill was put out to pasture, but he always believed that phage therapy was going to be important. So when um, Chip contacted him, he gave his advice to Chip and said, look, this is a guy who's fully colonized with this organism. It's in his sputum, it's in his blood, it's everywhere. And if there's a hidden reservoir of bacteria that the phage isn't able to get to 
because you're only treating him through the catheters in his abdomen, then that, that, that bacteria could become resistant to the phage and then you'll be you know, out of luck. So he goes, treat him intravenously. And of course, that's higher risk. Um, so um, we now had a phage cocktail. The first one that Texas developed was uh, the, the fastest one because the Navy folks got involved later. Um, and you can see that it's labeled with, with all of the permissions that we got from the FDA on a compassionate basis. And the dose that CHIP came up with was a billion phages per dose every two hours that we would you know, put into Tom's body. Now, compared to an antibiotic that takes 10 to 15 years to develop in a billion dollar or more price tag, this is developed within three weeks, even when we had to go to direct environmental sources. So that was pretty awesome. But this is what Tom looked like the day that we started phage therapy. He wasn't squeezing anybody's hand anymore. He was in a deep coma. He was in multi-stage organ failure. That means that, you know, all your organ systems are shutting down. He was thought to be within hours of dying. And I signed the consent form for kidney dialysis the day that we started phage therapy. But you know what? We didn't need it. He woke up three days later, lifted his head off the pillow, and kissed his daughter's hand. And she was on shift that day. So... Um, it was a real miracle. I mean, people in the ICU see all sorts of things happen, but the director of the ICU said to me that she'd never seen anybody so close to death that made a near complete recovery. Now, of course, Tom had lost 100 pounds. He had to learn how to, you know, talk, walk, everything all over again like a baby. It took, um, he was in the hospital nine months for the, from the very beginning. He left. Um, wearing a Superman shirt. Um, and I want to show you one more electron micrograph. This is actually Tom's bacteria stained in blue being attacked by the navy phages that are stained in green. We actually included this electron micrograph in the book um, because it's pretty awesome to look at. Um, and uh, it took a lot of permissions to get this because this um, scanning electron micrograph was generated by the Department of Homeland Security at the request of the Navy, which is pretty amazing. Now, um, our story was presented at the 100th anniversary of the discovery of the bacteriophage a year after Tom was cured. So he was cured in um, March of 2016. So a year later, it was presented at the Pasteur Institute by Dr. Biswas, who um, got a standing ovation. And after after that, the story went viral, but in a good way, um, because now um, patients and their families were finding that, you know, maybe there was a way to save their loved one, like I was able to save mine. And so I got calls from all over the world. The first call came from um, someone in Indonesia who had a family member in China. The next call came from you know, someone in South America. Then we started to get calls from all the US and I realized, oh my God, this is like gonna be a big deal. And um, we wanted to do the best we could because total strangers had stepped up to save my husband. So why, I wasn't gonna turn anybody away. So the same labs that got involved in my husband's case, many of them are still working today with us as partners to source phages for um, patients. And um, also, um, you know, we were on, you know, the Today Show, People Magazine, uh, that heading was hilarious. It said, um, sewage saved my husband's life. <laughs> it's like, oh man. Um, and, but what was interesting for the scientists in the audience is that we sent the case report, um, which included the protocol for how we prepared phage for Tom, to all the top medical journals and all of them rejected it. The New England Journal sent um, back a line from the editor saying, I don't believe it. And what, it was interesting because after the paper was published in a good journal, but not one of the weekly ones, um, all of those same journals got excited about it. So the Lancet commissioned a commentary. JAMA did a Q&A with Dr. Schooley that has been since reprised a second time with like an audio um, interview. And so um, it, that um, Russian taint, as it's called, has really bled over into the medical field. And it's taken some time for the medical community to kind of get past that and to see that this therapy is not just um, you know, um, a flash in the pan. So um, many successes and cases have occurred that our chancellor at the, the University of California, San Diego, gave us seed funding to start what became the first dedicated phage therapy center in North America that I co-direct now with Dr. Schooley called the Center for Innovative Phage Applications and Therapeutics, or, or IPATH. 
as we call it. Now our goal at iPath is to help other patients like Tom get phage therapy more easily and to also usher phage therapy into clinical trials to ensure that it's tested so that the FDA can approve it on a re so that average everyday people can get it without having to be at death's door. So we opened iPath in June of 2018, and the day that we opened, Science Magazine, which is one of the top journals in the world, published a commentary where a, a microbiologist was quoted saying, this is a game changer in the field. Now it's not all rosy at iPath because we've had over 2,000 requests for phage therapy, and if you look at this pipeline, it's rather leaky. So about half of the people who want phage therapy aren't even eligible for it because there are still antibiotic options left for them. And since this is a, a therapy that you know has to be approved on a case-by-case -case basis, the FDA will says, you know, if you've got antibiotic options left, then we won't approve it. So um, for the patients that phage therapy has been deemed um, to be an important route to try to save their lives, we have initiated phage hunts and it's different labs and even companies around the world have offered and they're donating their time to do this because you can't charge for an experimental treatment. Some of the times patients die before we can find phages that are a match for them. And other times we find phage that aren't really appropriate for phage therapy because they need to be manipulated to make them better bacterial killers. And I'll get into that in a minute. But nevertheless, um, you know, at iPath alone, we have treated now 57 patients and we have had success in the majority of them. Sometimes we clear the infection, but the person dies of their underlying condition. And so that's one of the challenges that we have. But there are now 90 clinical trials underway and we're, we're involved in several of them. Now, um, Tom's bacteria isn't the only kind of bacteria that can be used, um, I mean, to um, that where phage therapy is, is, uh, can be used. We've seen uh, lots of different bacteria that um, um, we can source phage for and have successful um, outcomes. But there are some um, organisms for which we can't find the right phage. And so, for example, Lyme disease, um, the bacteria involved in that is called Borrelia, and we can find phage, but they're not ideal. They're, they're a sleepy kind of phage. They're called temperate phage, and they don't kill the bacteria, and they can carry um, antibiotic resistance genes or toxin genes. So those phages will likely have to be manipulated in order to be bacterial killers. But nevertheless, that research is also underway. So we have, and, and many other groups around the world now, um, have published papers, case reports, case series. There is now a phage therapy program at Baylor University. There's one at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. There's one at Yale University. There's one at the University of Pittsburgh. There's a phage Canada. There's a phage Australia. The, there's a phage UK. Um, the Royal Astrid Military Hospital in Belgium um, has a, a, a great phage therapy program. And of course, the program in Georgia and Poland are still ongoing. So phage now is kind of all the rage. Um, and you'll see that since Tom's case report was published in 2017, there's been an explosion of case reports. We've um, also um, received requests for a variety of different kinds of infections. And um, often when people see this slide, they think, oh, I know somebody who has a chronic urinary tract infection that isn't responding to antibiotics. And we often you know, get requests like that. Or somebody who has had um, a prosthetic knee or, or hip inserted. Anybody who has hardware that's placed inside their body, it's prone to bacterial infections. And um, those bacterial infections call um, form biofilms, which I call the, the microbial version of the Borg. Um, it's very hard for antibiotics to penetrate. So um, those kinds of, of infections are, are very impervious to antibiotics and yet phage can get through those biofilms. So as I mentioned, um, we're involved in clinical trials at iPath. Dr. Schooley and uh, Dr. Tama from Johns Hopkins um, let lead now what became the first intravenous phage therapy trial that the NIH has sponsored. So the NIH has gotten on board, which is great because we definitely need their help. Um, the Economist published an article last year where they um, showed the, the increase in the number of clinical trials that have, have, has um, occurred, and I mentioned there's 90 that are ongoing, and that's what we need to ensure that phage therapy could be approved by bodies, uh, regulatory bodies like the FDA. 
Now, one of the other really exciting things that's gone on is that some of these phages, as I mentioned, they have to be genetically manipulated to be better killers. And one of the um, infections that is a big problem are mycobacterium infections. Uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis is a cousin to the one that was killing this girl, uh, mycobacterium obsessus. Now these are intracellular pathogens. It's very hard for antibiotics to treat them. And mycobacterium infections can also become disseminated. So in this case, this is a girl with cystic fibrosis who'd had a double lung transplant. And this organism was not only attacking her new lungs, but it involved her liver and she had skin nodules. Um, and she was miserable. In fact, she was in hospice when her mother heard about Tom's case, reached out to her doctor. The doctor reached across the pond to see if anybody could help, and Dr. Schooley got involved. And um, while we had been phage hunting for other patients, we'd come across this program called Sea Phages. Um, it's headquartered at the University of Pittsburgh, and it started as a um, educational program for undergraduate students, teaching them about microbiology and virology, doing the plaque assay like I showed you. They bring in um, you know, sewage and they look for phages. Well, um, the University of Pittsburgh has a, um, a phage library of over 13,000 phages that are active against these specific kinds of mycobacteria. And um, nobody ever knew that they had therapeutic potential until Isabel's case. Now, Dr. Hatful, who leads up that program, he um, screened their whole library and found one phage that was a good killer. And its, it's na name was Muddy. It had been sourced on a rotting eggplant by a student in South Africa, of all places. And, um, and, and then he found two other phages, which were not great killers. Um, they were the sleepy kind. And so he cleaved out the gene that forced those sleepy phages to become the phage rage kind. So this became the first genetically modified phage cocktail and they wanted to use it on Isabel. Now Isabel lived in the UK and this is a country that had undergone you know, the mad cow outbreak um, and they're certainly not really interested in anything as, that would be considered a GMO. But they reviewed the case and they said, well, a gene was taken away, a gene wasn't added. It's possible that this phage could have evolved to have dropped that repressor gene. And so we're gonna let this go forward. Well, Isabel had been in hospice and after a week of intravenous phage therapy treatment based on Tom's protocol, she left the hospital within a week. She responded well enough that she was able to go back to school, finish her A-levels, get a part-time job, learn to drive, leave the country for the first time to go on vacation to Spain. She lived an extra three years before she died of cystic fibrosis. Unfortunately, phage therapy can't cure that. But what this example has done um, is inspire a lot of biotech companies and even some pharmas to get into the phage space because if you can modify phage and patent that um, more easily than natural phage, then you've got a product that you can take to market. And so um, this has become a very um, important area. It also has taught the C phages program that they're doing something more than just teaching students how to isolate phage. They are teaching students that they are citizen scientists that can help save lives. And so um, I'm here because the Herbert Hoover uh, Foundation um, funded um, a training program that um, has bonded us at IPATH with Ohio State University's CFAGES program that is led by Dr. Sarah Ball, who introduced me. And here on our, this slide, I'm getting kind of choked up here, are some students who are sourcing phage. And we are going to be um, taking those phages and putting them into the IPATH phage library and um, having a student intern from OSU come to IPATH to learn how to you know, sequence these phages and annotate them, et cetera. So this is super exciting. I, I, there might even be some um, um, these students from the C-Phages program in the audience. So if you are, wave your hands. I know it's exam week next week. Yay, C-Phages program, <laughs> woohoo! I also want to give a shout out to Miranda Strickland, um, who's our iPath intern for social media, um, who I met for the first time today because she's been working remotely. So thanks to uh, Miranda. And what we're doing now is we're building a phage library so that you don't have to go back to sewage every time somebody needs a phage, right? That's a little onerous. I do like to tell my husband that he's full of shit. But... <laughs> 
<laughs> I can say that on YouTube, right? Um, now, I, um, before I close, I, I do want to say that there are lots of other applications of phage that we're learning about as well. So I've spent my time here talking about the medical applications for people that have superbug infections that are not responding to antibiotics. However, when we think of antimicrobial resistance, we think of it um, from the One Health perspective. That's the interface between animals, the environment, and humans. And so phage can be used um, in lots of different applications here. They can be used to disinfect wastewater. Um, they can be used in veterinary applications. They can be used to groom the microbiome. Um, I spoke to the, uh, some nutrition experts who are um, wanting to include phage in probiotics. Um, and there's even a, an, a phage product for acne that's under development right now. Um, but phage can also be used in outbreak situations. So I'm gonna leave you with one last example example that is ongoing right now. Um, there um, were these eye drop preparations that were manufactured in India for people that have dry eye syndrome. Um, these aren't the eye drops that you buy over the counter. These are prescription eye drops because these people um, who have this problem, they, they have to be using eye drops on a regular basis and the ones that you get over the counter have um, a chemical in it that will damage their, their eye. So unfortunately, um, poor infection control in the manufacturing process led this eye drop formulation to become contaminated with an extremely drug resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is a nasty superbug. And it has uh, several different antimicrobial resistance genes and it has now gone global. Um, so just in the U.S. alone, there was 81 cases, four deaths. Um, several people had to have their eyeballs amputated. Um, and so it's very nasty. Now, um, we heard about this on the news, and Dr. Schooley, in his um, wisdom, said, we got phage for that. So he contacted the CDC and said, do you want to send us this bacterial isolate? We'll see if we can match phage to it. And they did. And boy, um, we used some wastewater that was left over from COVID surveillance. And and um, Dr. David Pride and his lab were able to find phage that are a match. So they're ready and waiting for any patient. We've also um, gotten involved in matched phage to the organism that's involved in um, a outbreak of contaminated um, uh, baby formula. Um, so, um, so phage can be used in a setting like this and we're excited about the prospects. So my husband and I realized that, you know what, we were privileged and we, we did go through the worst ordeal that we've ever gone through in our lives, but now we see it as a blessing because it's helping other people. So as a result of that, we decided to write our story so that we could, you know, share the knowledge, um, not just about phage therapy, but about the scourge of antimicrobial resistance. Because if I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist and I was blinded by this pandemic, then the average person doesn't know that this pandemic is already here and we need to do something about it. Now, on the bottom right of this photo is um, Republican Congressman um, uh, Morgan Griffith from Virginia, who held a briefing um, of Congress on antimicrobial resistance, and he held up our book and saying, this is how I learned about superbugs and phage therapy. So um, you just never know um, what you can do when you um, put mind to matter. Um, I also want to thank a lot of our collaborators um, with IPATH, including the Herbert W. Hoover Foundation, who has um, funded our little training program, and we're hoping for a renewal. Um, and we've got lots of different labs around the world that help us hunt phages for people. But I personally have to thank a global village of strangers who stepped up to save my husband's life. I haven't even met them all. And I, every time I give a talk, somebody will come up and introduce themselves. And sometimes they were directly involved in, in his case. And I also, uh, although my family's story is a success story, there's so many people that are waiting for phage and I wanna give a shout out. Again, I'm gonna get choked up here. Um, Jennifer Nelson is a new friend that I met through social media. She's living with cystic fibrosis. She lives in Ohio. Her and her mom wanted to come today, but she's in the hospital right now. Phage has been matched for her, but we don't have a GMP facility that is, um, is able to manufacture phages fast enough because so many people are waiting for it. So that's the other thing that we're fundraising for. And um, Jennifer is waiting for phage and she wanted to say hello to all of you. So I just want you to keep um, her in your thoughts and prayers. 
And um, I want to thank you all for having me today. Um, if there's time for questions, I'm happy to do that. But there's also a reception upstairs. And if you'd like to purchase the book, um, feel free. Um, um, and I'll be happy to sign and dedicate. I usually bring my husband with me. Um, he's back at home looking after our three cats. And he gives you his best. So thank you very much. Imagine there might be a few questions for Dr. Strathy. Hang on, I can't see anybody yet. Uh, go ahead, sir. Uh, any in indication or thoughts that um, phages will follow the same arc that antibiotics did, and hopefully be resistance to them? Any, any thoughts on that? Good question. Okay, so the question is, um, what happens if bacteria generate resistance to phage? Well, you know, um, the, the difference here is that phage and bacteria are alive. So they're, they're always duking it out and have been for almost 4 billion years. So the, the bacteria um, have their CRISPRs, which are part of their own immune system. The phage have their anti-CRISPRs, so they're always kind of evolving. So the good news is, is that with so many phage out there, you just need to have a phage library that has lots of different options for you. And in my husband's case, the bacteria did develop resistance to the phage because it turned out we didn't have time to sequence those phage to know that they were almost all identical. So within a couple of weeks, it had developed resistance, but we were able to go and source new phage to match the bacterial mutants. So you can do that. And if you use a phage cocktail, like several different phages, then ideally you would be picking ones that attack different receptors so that it's harder for the bacteria to develop resistance. And then finally, back, um, phage and, and antibiotics often work in synergy. So if you can predict and use um, machine learning techniques to choose phage and antibiotics in combination, then you're, you're a real leg up. So um, yes, it, it, resistance occurs, but the idea is to stay ahead of the resistance. Uh, let's see, ma'am, go ahead. Well, certainly, you know, you can, as Dr. Schooley would say, you can look at the patient. So in my husband's case, he woke up, he started to improve. Even um, after the resistance emerged, he continued to improve because he had been healthy prior, previously, and we knocked down the bacterial burden in his body enough that his own immune system could kick in. But you can t test different body fluids to see whether the bacteria is still present. So in my husband's case, he was treated with phage therapy for a month, but he cleared his infection within three months. So we didn't know if he was going to be cleared of his infection ever, but he is. And so it, it was no longer in his blood. It was no longer in his saliva or sputum. And so that's how you know. Uh, let's see. Uh, far away guy first. Okay, that's a good question too. What happens to the phage after they've been eating up the bacteria? Well, that, that's one of the beauties of, of phage therapy is that if the, if the phage are no longer finding bacteria that have the receptor that they match to, the body's own immune system filters it out. So this, the, it's usually the liver and the spleen. And for the medical folks out there, that's the reticuloendothelial system. So um, it, it, they just are removed and filtered out of the body. So antibiotics still are working and, and causing their damage. But phage is, like, you could think of it as like nano precision medicine. It attacks the bacteria that you want to remove and then it's, and then it's gone. Have we, have we tried to source phage for Lyme's disease? I mentioned earlier that yes, that there are phage that will attack the Borrelia bacteria that are causative agent of Lyme, but they're not the ideal phage in most cases. They're these temperate or sleepy phages. So those phage will need to be manipulated. There is um, a, a world famous phage um, expert, Martha Clokey, who's very close to being able to have a product for Lyme um, that is that our phage, and she's been working on it for a long time. The problem with Lyme is that it's often a co-infection with another bacteria called Bartonella, 
And so you're not just dealing with one bacteria, you're dealing with two. And so that gets more complicated because then if you have to go source and page for that, then, you know. But I could see it happening. Um, I, I just, it's not one of the easier ones to deal with. Well, they, they're, Chris, so the question is, can you use genetic engineering or CRISPR? That's exactly what's being done now for um, some bac bacteriophage. They need to be genetically manipulated, and CRISPR-Cas gene editing can help do that. So there are teams of people that are working on genetically modified or even synthetic phages. So let, let's take one question. I'd like to prioritize a question from any students. How about you? So I, I I only heard part of the question. Are there there's some phage for? So for the bacteria that you found with the trials where you couldn't isolate phages, have you looked into those to figure out why? Well, there are teams of folks that are looking for, um, you know, why we can't find phage. But sometimes it's just that we don't know enough about microbial ecology. Um, and so, for example, um, one of the, um, the stories that I heard is that. Um, that Cambodian rice patties are a great place to source phage for Burkholderia cepatia. Well, how do we know that? It's because Burkholderia cepatia ended up infecting um, people that were working in the rice patties picking rice. And so um, if that goes into a database where, you know, somebody's looking for phage for a certain organism, the, you know, what we are, are learning cumulatively can help us um, source phage better. And that's one of my ideas that AI could really, um, you know, help improve. But you're right, we need to learn a lot more about phage. Um, Colophage, we know a lot about, but there's a lot of phage that, you know, most of the genes we ha are an unknown function. We have no idea what they're doing. So I know there are a lot of questions left, but uh, the Barnes & Noble team will only be here for about, uh, like, 10 more minutes in case anybody wants to buy a book based on this uh, terrific talk. And I guess a few people will. But let's uh, thank Dr. Strathy not only for a fantastic talk, but for bravely soldiering on through the AV difficulties at the beginning, for which we <laughs> apologize. <laughs>